Thank you very much for joining me on my fourth presentation. Do have a look at the previous ones as this one follows on naturally from them. The topic of whether or not Elizabeth I bore any children at all is extremely contentious, even before considering any possible identity of such a child. Opinions seem to be polarised, with no room for doubt on either side. The image on the right is of Elizabeth in 1575, at around the time when some authors believe that she could have been pregnant. On the left is Henry Rosalie, 3rd Earl of Southampton, in 1594 when he was 21. During the middle of the 20th century, largely in America, the theory that he was the Queen's illegitimate son became prominent. This view is still strongly held by some authors, but in the United Kingdom, few give it credence. This is the first of two presentations on the fascinating topic of whether or not Henry Rosalie, third Earl of Southampton, was the son of Elizabeth I and Edward de Vere. It may seem an odd thing to do, but I am going to approach this by considering a poem, the one that sits in a cartouche at the bottom of the pregnancy portrait of Elizabeth I. In the second part, I will look at whether or not what it reveals could possibly have occurred. The story so far is that we've had a good look at the mysterious painting hanging at Hampton Court Palace of a sad young woman and the weeping stag. I made the case for this being an allegorical portrait of a pregnant Elizabeth I appearing as the goddess Diana and that the stag was Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford, who wrote under the pen name of William Shakespeare. I followed this with two videos about the relationship of Elizabeth with Nonsuch Palace, which revealed her close affiliation with Diana through the imagery in the Grove of Diana. This further strengthened my case for the figure in the portrait being Elizabeth in her guise as the goddess. Obviously, most paintings do not have an accompanying poem. The image is sufficient to convey the meaning of the work. This may, of course, be aided by a title, either in the painting, as was common in Tudor times, or on the frame. There are several Tudor portraits which do have poems. For example, the Ditchley portrait of Elizabeth, painted by Marcus Gearhart the Younger and presented to the Queen by Sir Henry Lee in 1592. You can see it tucked away up against the frame on the right-hand side. Unfortunately, cropping of the painting has removed the last word from each line, and other words are unclear. The theme, however, is one of a eulogy to the Queen. Even from what we can see, it does not appear to be a literary masterpiece. There is a painting of Sir Henry himself and his dog Bevis by the same artist. Here the theme is one of a eulogy to his faithful friend. The pregnancy portrait is in a different league. It is in sonnet format, in other words 14 lines long, and the rhythm is iambic pentameter, which I'll come back to later. It's both beautiful and enigmatic, nearly telling us something, but leaving us frustrated as there are insufficient clues as to exactly what. So here's an important statement. Uh, I know that uh, some of you have had trouble grasping that the painting is a highly sophisticated allegory, the elements of which are laid out in a scene which never actually happened. Elizabeth never posed, pregnant in a wood, with a stag, weeping or otherwise. It's all symbolic, even perhaps the pregnancy. The second issue is the poem. Although written in the first person, I'm certain Elizabeth did not write it. It was written by whoever commissioned the painting, i.e. the stag, most likely Edward de Vere. It was a method of getting a message across by putting the words and thoughts into the mind of the subject. So please bear this in mind. My aim here is to look for evidence of how the poem is meant to enhance or explain the portrait, and I'm going to do this in a number of ways. Firstly, with interpretation of the words by a simple reading of the poem. Secondly, by analysis of the text of the poem, line by line. 
Thirdly, analysis of hidden messages within the text of the poem. Fourthly, by analysis of any hidden message in the layout of the poem. Fifthly, by analysis of the cartouche. Sixthly, consideration of the poem in relation to the Latin text in the painting. And lastly, a look at comparison of this poem with another one. Now, writing and publishing anything in Tudor times was a very risky business. Formal printing was tightly controlled and any book, pamphlet or play had to pass the official censor, the Lord Chamberlain, or his assistant, the Master of the Revels. Lord Chamberlain from 1855 to 1596 was Henry Carey on the left. From 1596 to 1597 was William Brooke, Lord Cobham in the centre. And from 1597 to 1603 was George Carey, son of Henry. And here they are, bent on rooting out all evil, or indeed any inconvenient truth. Now much has been written about censorship of written works, and many were recalled and burned. We also know that paintings of the Queen were closely scrutinised to ensure she was how she wanted to look, not how she really was. There's nothing that I can find about formal censorship of other works of art, in particular those that contain a poem. Perhaps as a novel idea, it was a good way to slip messages past the censors. Publishing anything that was considered seditious could lead to punishment and imprisonment. It was crucial, therefore, that writers took great care not to be caught out. This was achieved in a number of ways. Firstly, by using poses or nicknames to hide their identity, such as Ignoto or Hadrian Doral. Secondly, by being deliberately ambiguous. And thirdly, by hiding messages within the text or the layout of a piece that could only be deciphered by those in the know. The Elizabethans loved to try to decipher hidden meanings, to such an extent that certain practitioners raised the design of ciphers to that of an extraordinarily high level. If you've time to spare, take a look at Alexander Waugh's YouTube video on the design of the front page of the 1609 edition of the Sonnets. Now, trying to decode messages written 400 years ago is no easy task, at least in part because of the language differences. We do, however, have some experience to draw from which have helped demonstrate the techniques used. So let's make a start. A simple reading of the poem. This is the poem sitting in the cartouche or frame. The technique employed is called scraffito, it, in which the artist overpaints a light layer with a dark one. Before this dries, the script is produced by scraping away the top layer. So this is writing rather than printing, and variation in the text in terms of size, shape and style and spelling is to be expected. Here's the text itself in higher resolution. There's been some deterioration over the years, but it's still easily readable. And now this is the text which I produced by typing over an image of the poem, making some attempt to reflect the differing sizes of the lettering and the text layout. The poem reads thus, The restless swallow fits my restless mind in still reviving, still renewing wrongs. Her just complaints of cruelly unkind are all the music that my life prolongs. With pensive thoughts my weeping stag I crown, whose melancholy tears my cares express. His tears in silence and my sighs unknown are all the physic that my harms redress. My only hope was in this goodly tree, which I did plant in love, bring up in care, but all in vain, for now too late I see, the shales be mine, the kernels others are. My music may be plaints, my physic tears, if this be all the fruit 
my love tree bears. Now, for the purposes of this study, I'm taking the stance that the person in the painting is Elizabeth I, for a whole variety of reasons explained in an earlier video. You may not agree with this viewpoint, but please bear with me and keep an open mind until you've heard what I'm going to say. I have paraphrased the text into modern English, which I hope helps you to understand what she is saying at the first level at least. The poem is in the first person with the subject of the portrait speaking. The subject tells us that her restless mind, which keeps going over things she's done wrong, is like a swallow singing cruel but just complaints about her. The song of the swallow is the only thing that sustains her life. She thoughtfully crowns her weeping stag, whose sad tears express her own worries. His silent tears and her hidden sadness are the only things that remedy the harm she has done. Her only hope had been in planting and tending a tree of love, which is the walnut in the picture. But this was in vain, as she discovers too late that the kernels, in other words, the central or essential part of the nuts, have been taken away by others, and she is left with dry outer shells. If her love tree bears no more fruit, then she only has the music of the swallow and the tears of her stag to sustain her. Now let's look deeper by taking each line in turn to see if there are any hidden messages or references. The restless swallow fits my restless mind in still reviving, still renewing wrongs. Now the analogy of the singing and complaining swallow is used, but why? Could it be a person whose songs or poetry, although critical of her, still give her something to live for? Could the swallow be a poet's muse? One clue may be in the poem of Sir John Davis entitled Orchestra, or a poem of dancing written in 1594. Davis concludes Orchestra by singing the praises of one living English poet far above the rest, the swallow, whose swift muse doth range through rare ideas and inventions strange, and even doth enjoy her joyful spring, and sweeter than the nightingale doth sing. Oh, that I might that singing swallow hear, to whom I owe my service and my love. His sugared tunes would so enchant mine ear, and in my mind such sacred fury move, as I should knock at heaven's great gate above. Now Davis doesn't tell us who the hidden poet is, but it is clearly someone using a swallow as his muse, and someone Davis knows and respects. Now note that the swallow is referred to as feminine, her joyful spring. This is because we're talking about the poet's muse, not the person of the poet himself. Note also the term sugared tunes, very similar to the sugared sonnets used to describe Shakespeare's work by Francis Mears in 1598. At this stage, it's fair to say that the lines are consistent with the hidden poet as Edward de Vere. In antiquity, swallows were associated with the gods, as well as the souls of the dead. In Greek and Roman mythologies, deities were able to change their form and metamorphose into a swallow. If you've seen my other presentations, you will realise that the Roman poet Ovid seems to be everywhere, in particular his work Metamorphoses, which describes the changing states of deities and other creatures in a poem extending to 15 books. Now what follows may be nothing, but here is another of his stories which is intriguing. It concerns two sisters, Philomela on the left and Procne on the right. Ovid's tale in Book 6 of Metamorphoses is one of censorship, and I warn you, it's not a pleasant one. To cut a long story short, Procne's husband, Terius, rapes her sister, Philomela. 
In order to stop her from telling what has happened, he cuts out her tongue. Believe me, it does get worse. Philomela, poor thing, unable to speak, weaves a tapestry to tell her sister what has happened to her. In turn, Procne, when she finds out, kills her son, cuts him up and serves him in a meal to Terius. As well as punishing him, the act renders mute Terius for the next generation. To finish off, the two sisters, both tainted, transform into a swallow, Procne, and a nightingale, Philomela, which can sing beautiful songs, thereby escaping their oppressor and finding new ways of communicating. As I mentioned in an earlier presentation, Ovid was banished from Rome for his views, but continued to write in Romania. So could this reference be relevant? There are a couple of reasons why I think it could. The works of Ovid were published in English in 1567, ostensibly by Arthur Golding, the uncle of Edward de Vere. Both were living in the same house at the time, and it's widely believed that the teenage de Vere, who was fluent in Latin, did the translations. The books became his favourite source for inspiration. Interesting, then, that the hidden poet, described by Sir John Davis, uses a swallow as his muse. You might be thinking that the tale is too erudite. Well, the internet is littered with references to it. And, uh, by the way, the Latin name for the nightingale is Philomela Lucina. And what about the fate of Terius? Well, he was turned into a hoopoe, a rather comical bird which doesn't really sing at all. Oh, and one more thing. If we go back to the painting, you will remember two of the birds in the walnut tree, a swallow sitting on the sawn-off branch, and right in the top of the tree is a songbird. You might also remember that I believe this bird, together with the walnut tree itself and the phoenixes on Elizabeth's robe, are a direct reference to William Shakespeare's poem The Phoenix and the Turtle Dove. We'll take a close look at this bird, I apologise for the grainy nature of the image. Note that it has an upright stance and a pale underbelly. Don't be confused by the appearance it is looking over its shoulder. This is a tip of a leaf behind. The beak is pale yellow. Now, I know bird identification is a bit difficult in this situation, but I am pretty sure that this is a nightingale. Just to remind you of Sir John Davis's poem, And sweeter than the nightingale doth sing, Oh, that I might that singing swallow hear. So far, we have reference to a hidden poet who uses a swallow as his muse, and I believe a very strong reference to the myth of Philomela and Procne, a story of censorship, communication by way of a tapestry, and ultimate escape by finding other ways of communication. Substitute a painting for tapestry, and someone describing in the sonnets as tongue-tied by authority, then the story starts to sound rather familiar. There is one more thing about the swallow. The bird is commonly referred to as a harbinger of spring. The Latin word for spring is, of course, ver, and I think you already know where this is going. Her just complaints of cruelly unkind. Interestingly, the swallow is feminine, but once again this is a reference to the poet's muse. Most authors report that the fifth uh, word is cruelty, but in fact close examination reveals that this is not the case. If you look at the G of the word reviving, top left, you can see a curling tail on the letter. Now look at the word cruelly and you will see that the tail of the G from the word renewing can easily be misinterpreted as a cross piece of the T. In that case, we're left with two adjectives. Is it possible that in the interests of rhyme, the word order has been altered? The most obvious one, which makes sense, being her just but 
cruelly unkind complaints. That still leaves us with two adjacent adjectives which seem to say much the same thing. There is another possibility here. Unkind has more than one meaning. In the Middle English Dictionary up to 1500 it could be used to mean contrary to a natural moral law, indecent, immoral or incestuous. An alternative meaning was to describe someone who was childless or barren. Indeed, it appears in verse 200 of Venus and Adonis by William Shakespeare. Venus, talking to Adonis, said, Oh, had thy mother born so hard a mind, she had not brought forth thee, but died unkind. So it is possible that the complaints lodged against Elizabeth may involve either some sexual indiscretion or her appearing to be a childless woman. Are all the music that my life prolongs? Line four. Although we're told that the swallow's songs are complaints, they seem to be the only thing keeping her going. I take this to mean that although critical, the songs are very important and meaningful to her, i.e. the hidden poet's work is vital to her survival. Let's move on to the stag. By now, if you've looked at my other presentations, you're well aware of the myth of Diana and Actaeon, in which the hunter is turned into a stag by Diana for spying on her when she was bathing. What we are presented with in the portrait is an extension of this and ties in with Elizabeth's dual personality, as we saw expressed in the Grove of Diana at Nonsuch. It summed up by the words on the plaques erected there. The chaste virgin naturally pitied Actaeon, but the powerful goddess revenged her wrong. There are other weeping stags in the literature. A weeping stag appears in a book seven of Virgil's Aeneid, when Aeneas' son Ascanius kills the pet stag of Sylvia, thereby starting a war. It struck the animal's flank and went into its belly. The wounded creature fled for refuge under the roof of the house, the house that it knew so well, and sought its familiar stall where it lay down, beseechingly weeping and weeping and calling out. The house was filled with its pitiful, woeful noise. In As You Like It, uh, scene one, act two, a melancholy Jacques contemplates a weeping stag. You can see the wound in the flank of the animal and the tears on its cheek. The big round tears coursed one another down his innocent nose. In piteous chase and thus the hairy fool stood on the extremist verge of the swift brook, augmenting it with tears. These are the only two examples I can find of the weeping stag scenario, and both are the result of a physical injury to the animal. The concept of a stag weeping as an extension of the Diana and Actaeon myth is, to my knowledge, unique. So what can we learn from the text? Lines five and six, with pensive thoughts, my weeping stag I crown whose melancholy tears my cares express. Well, pensive is a pun on the French word pense, to think, the word being the source for the flower name pansy, said to be Elizabeth's uh, favourite flower. In Tudor times, the flower and wild version, Viola tricolore, was regarded as a symbol of remembrance. The name love in idleness implied someone so besotted that they could think of nothing but their lover. An alternative name is Heartsease, which came from Saint Euphrasia, a nun from Constantinople, who refused marriage and took the veil. The three colours of the pansy, white for purity, yellow for joy and purple for mourning, gave the flower the name of Herb Trinity, relating to the life of the Virgin Mary. Not only does the pansy appear in crowning the stag, but in Elizabeth's headdress and in various forms in the designs of the robe. 
Elizabeth refers to my stag. Now, many uh, landed women of Tudor times had large estates with stags on them, so ownership by the Queen is not exclusive. The word my confers to me as being a sense of something personal. This was not any old stag, but it certainly was a very special one. The act of crowning is, of course, not exclusive to invest in a monarch, and I believe in this instance it can be read as an act of love or contrition. The second, his tears in silence and my sighs unknown are all the physic that my harms redress. The implication is that the stag is silent because it is unable to speak and Elizabeth is silent because she dare not. These lines tell us that the silent tears of the stag and her hidden sighs are the only things that to an extent remedy the harm she has done. In other words, the fact that because their shared sorrow for what has gone on is hidden, it goes some way to limit the damage. My only hope was in this goodly tree, which I did plant in love, bring up in care. This first line tells us that in the past she had just one hope, but hope of what? I can think of no other answer but achieving a Tudor succession. Elizabeth then refers to this goodly tree. The tree being referred to has to be the walnut tree in the background, as she is speaking in the present tense. The term goodly means of pleasing or fine appearance. It stands as a metaphor, but for what? My way of looking at it is that it stands for her way of ensuring the succession, not in the way of a family tree, but as a tree of love. This is confirmed by the use of love tree in a later line. The second line continues with the tree metaphor, but could have a secondary meaning. You sow a seed, but plant a tree. So could planting in love be a reference to implanting an offspring into another place. In addition, there is a difference in meaning between bringing up in care and bringing up with care. Albeit in modern English, the former implies raising a child in some form of protective environment. The latter is more suitable for nurturing a plant. So does this mean that a child was put somewhere and then taken back into her care? Here is a painting of William Cecil, Lord Burley, chairing the Court of Wards. As part of William Cecil's plan to enrich himself while plunging the wealthy into penury, the fatherless children of the gentry were taken into care by way of the Court of Wards, of which Cecil was leader. His friends bid for the right to manage their lands, and when the children reached maturity, there was an expensive exit payment for what was left of their estate. Edward de Vere was the first of such children, and Henry Rosalie was the last. Many of the children were brought up in Cecil House, his home. They were given first-class educations and were considered stepchildren of the Queen. As a result of all of this, Cecil went on from being a jobbing lawyer to the richest man in the country. Lines 11 and 12. But all in vain, for now too late I see, the shales be mine, the colonels others are. Continuing in the present tense, the metaphor goes on. All her effort has been in vain, and she now realises that it's too late. The question here is, what is it too late for? One must assume that she has continued to believe that all was well with her plan, then something unexpected happens and she realises that she's lost control. In the second line, it's interesting in that the items are in the plural, both shales and the discarded outer part of the nut, and the kernels, the essential vital parts of which have gone to others. This may simply be a result of following the metaphor of the walnut tree, which obviously carries many fruits, it would, however, be just as easy to use singular nouns 
without affecting the meter of the poem. It's also possible that it is intentional, implying that more than one child had been involved or one way of, of securing the succession and that there was only one chance left. You may remember that in the portrait the swallow sits on the sawn off branch of a tree. This may imply the removal of a dynastic line. And the last two lines, my music may be plaints, my physic tears, if this be all the fruit my love tree bears. As in traditional sonnet format, the last two lines sum up the whole piece. Elizabeth tells us that if there is no more fruit, i.e. children, then she has to be content with the swallow's complaints and the stag's tears. She is trapped in sorrow and regret. So far, so ambiguous. The poem hints at, but does not confirm the identity of the stag, or indeed from the text alone that the subject is Elizabeth. However, referral to past events is consistent with Elizabeth being pregnant as a younger woman as she appears in the painting. There is also a hint that she was creating her own dynastic line, the allegorical tree. In this respect, it's interesting that some have interpreted the 1571 Succession Act as allowing bastards to inherit the throne. Now let's look at analysis for hidden messages within the text. In order to take things further, we have to enter the rather murky but fascinating world of ciphers and hidden meanings. In order to understand this, you need some basic information as to how the Tudor mind worked. One man's in particular, that of John Dee. Dee was a doctor, mystic, cryptologist, astrologer and mathematician. He was also an alchemist and even he talked to angels. He was also a very religious man. One of his central tenets was that everything could be defined by numbers and that each individual had one or more numbers which united them with God. Not surprisingly, the Trinity was involved here and he had a concept that the Trinity could be contained within the quaternary. In other words, by making a pattern of three elements, a fourth one could be contained within it. This fourth element signified the connection of the individual to God. In his case, he used the symbol delta, the Greek letter. This has three sides, representing the trinity. It is also the fourth letter of the Greek alphabet, quaternary. Dee's fascination was not just numbers, but also geometrical shapes and patterns, and hiding messages within text. Such secret codes and ciphers allowed individuals to convey information known only to themselves and their intended audience. If you feel inclined to form an impression of Dee's skill, take a look at Alexander Waugh's YouTube video about him entitled John Dee's Secret Patron Revealed. This man thought on an immense scale and it's hard to escape the concept that he encoded things for posterity to escape the censors of the time, but with the hope of decoding in years to come. Hiding the name of the youth in the sonnets and the site of Edward de Vere's burial place within the text of the front page of the sonnets are perfect examples of his work. As I hope to show you, this poem is another example of his extraordinary skill. We're now going to look at the numbers associated with another man, Edward de Vere, who followed the principles of John Dee. He too was very religious, which many people find surprising. Although he may not have shared our modern moral values, he was very aware of his role as working through God to communicate with his audience. Decoding of the sonnet front page tells us that it was written by God and de Vere. The first two numbers are 17 and 40. The 17th is obvious because he was the 17th Earl of Oxford. 
This number is scattered all over the publications of the late 16th century to such an extent that it is well beyond the occurrence of chance. Those who knew the true identity of William Shakespeare left a trail of acknowledgement that is still being followed. 40 is a bit more difficult to understand. The 19th letter of the Greek alphabet is Tau. It is an ancient Christian sign for the cross. Three such Taus joined at their bases is called the Triple Tau and it in later centuries became the emblem of royal arch masonry. Within the symbol is a fourth T hidden upside down. In de Vere's world, 40 was synonymous with 40. This signified his closeness to God, the quaternary within the tertiary. Forties are also to be found hidden in the sonnet frontispiece and the coded description below the effigy of William Shakespeare in Stratford, which when decoded tells you where the real William Shakespeare is buried. Another example of a number associated with Edward de Vere is 57. T is the 19th letter of both the Roman and the Greek alphabets. 319 equals 57, which of course is the sum of 17 and 40. Once again, emphasising his closeness to God. Hopefully you are still with me. There is a, an ancient coding system termed gematria, which involves assigning a numerical value to individual letters in order to encode text. There were many variations of it over time. The Greek letter chi was assigned the value of 40 at around the time of the New Testament. The Greek letter Rho is the 17th letter of the Greek alphabet. The superimposition of these two letters forms the Chi Rho Christogram. This incorporates the first two letters of the Greek word Christos or Christ. The combination of 17 and 40 again crystallising Edward de Vere's proximity to God. Once again, this concept is explained in much more eloquent eloquence than my own by Alexander War. Complicated though this may seem, it's important to have some knowledge of it to appreciate what follows. You should also know that for something to be validated, it is often repeated three times, referring back to the Trinity. I'm going to digress slightly at this point to tell you about another number relevant to Edward de Vere. This point is not about the poem, but fits nicely with numbers related to him. The number we are considering is 153. Now 153 is a triangular number, which has a series of features. The one of interest here is that if the numbers from 1 to 153 are laid out in a triangle, they appear like this. There are 17 rows and 17 numbers along the bottom. Look again at the pregnancy portrait. You will see in a prominent position on Elizabeth's right thumb is a ring. This is facing directly towards the viewer and is directly above the stag's head. As you can see, there are five black stones. Now imagine for a moment that you had just four stones and you were asked to number them. I would wager that you would start at one point and go either in a clockwise direction or perhaps in an anti-clockwise direction. If there were five stones, then this sequence would carry on to the fifth stone. As you can see, the magic 153 number appears and it remains even if it is rotated. To the initiated, 153 equals 17 equals De Vere. My interpretation of this is that Elizabeth is pointing at the stag, not with her index finger, as a ring here would be mal rotated, 
but with her thumb, where the ring is in the correct plane. If I'm right, then this forms strong support for the stag being Edward de Vere. Hopefully you're now getting the flavour of how their minds were working, all based on a fervent belief in religion and the fundamental belief in numbers as the basis of everything. For Edward de Vere, 17, 40, 57 and 153 demonstrate his proximity to the Almighty. As you're probably thinking, these philosophies were the basis of pre-Masonic thinking. There is one other interesting thing. I'm following on from a recent video by Alexander Waugh in which he showed a picture of this man, William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke, Chancellor of Oxford University, Lord Chamberlain and dedicatee of the first folio of Shakespeare's works. It was the posture which caught his attention, in particular the left arm, which he interpreted as the obsolete digraph thorn which stood for the sound th. Now, not much like a thorn, you might say, except that in one version of this symbol, it looked very much like a thorn. So if you take the T and H of th, and you widen the H, and then move the T, you arrive at the triple tau. Now look again at the pregnancy portrait. Could this also be a digraph thorn? Was the Queen a member of this illustrious group of pre-Masonic thinkers? After all, John Dee was her personal physician at one point. Did she have her own sacred numbers? Was she indeed the figurehead? Something else to work on. So let's uh, go back to the poem. We're going to take a look at metric feet and iambic pentameter. These strange terms are used to describe a particular rhythm of a poem. Each two syllables make up a metric foot, and there are five of these in a line. As you read the poem, the stress is placed on the second syllable. So the rhythm goes da-dum, 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 da-dum. So the first line of the poem then reads the rest less soi, lo fits, my rest less mind, with ten syllables in each line. So, so in our poem, each of the three main verses has 40 syllables. In De Vere's world, 40 equals 40, repeated three times to verify it. Not impressed? Well, I wouldn't expect you to be. But remember, the poet chose to use the iambic pentameter. Here is the last line of the poem. If this be all the fruit my love tree bears. Now, look at the two words love tree. Although written as two separate words with a fairly large space, I suggest that these two nouns the former of which is acting as an adjective. It could also be written as love tree or even love hyphen tree. In either case, it's the 17th word of the last paragraph. I've inverted the colours to make the text clearer. Firstly, it's obvious that e via can be extracted from it. In addition, the t of tree appears rather odd, not being a typical lowercase t. Here are the 35 t's which are in the poem, and there are four different styles. Here they're numbered in order as they appear in the poem itself. The first type is the large capital, the second is the lowercase t, the third has a curly tail on the top, and the fourth is a smaller version of the first. So let's take a closer look at the lowercase t's. Here they are, 15 of them. Now to my eye, number 35 in the poem has no upstroke on the t. It looks more like a tau. 
there is good clearance around the letter, so there was no need to squeeze it in. This may be nothing, but an anagram of E. Vir with a tau in the middle of it might be taken as verification in terms of De Vir identifying himself with that letter. Let's look now for some more hidden words. If we look at lines 1, 7 and 9 of the poem, then from each of them we can form the name Rosalie. Well, it could just be chance. If you move the 1 down, then you get 17. If you add up the line numbers, they also come to 17. It's very hard to quantify the probability of this arising by chance. In the 154 sonnet sequence of Shakespeare, Rosalie can be derived from 20% of the lines. In any one sonnet, there are only three cases in which the line numbers add up to 17. I'm advised that in our own sonnet, the occurrence reaches statistical significance. There is one more thing. The entire sentence, Henry Rosalie is my only son and heir, can be derived from each of the three lines, but can only be done so by using letters more than once. Now let's take a look at the whole of the last line of the poem. If this be all the fruit my love tree bears. These letters can be arranged to form this sentence. Evia is the true father of my still life babe. This is a complete anagram with all letters used only once. Is this by chance? Well, the combination of via and true would support its veracity. Indeed, the de via motto is nihil vero virius, nothing truer than truth. The use of O was a valid abbreviation for of in Tudor times. The term babe may seem odd, but it does occur in the last two lines of sonnet 115. Love is a babe, then might I not say so, to give full growth to that which still doth grow. But what about still life? Does this mean that the child was still born? I think not. Still life was a valid form of art in the late 16th century and included not only static objects, but also scenes with human figures. It is thought to have originated in the Netherlands. The name is derived from the Dutch word stilleven. Marcus Kierhaerts the Younger, the painter of the portrait, was of course Flemish. Now let's delve into hidden geometry in the poem. I looked at this poem for a number of months and thought there was something odd about it. This is not at the beginning and ends of the lines, but in the centres. Some words seem to have spaces on each side which were too large. I thought initially that this was because the writer of the script wanted to ensure that the poem fitted nicely into the cartouche, possibly by starting in the middle and working outwards. Then I discovered this. If you count the words from the beginning, you arrive at the 17th word, which is of. If you then construct a perpendicular between the two letters, it intersects four words of, my, that, love and fruit. Rearranged, this can be read as that fruit of my love. So we have Rosalie written three times horizontally and the 17th word of the poem leads us to that fruit of my love. Put together, of course, it reads Rosalie, that fruit of my love. Could this just be chance? There is a technical point here. Photographing an object such as a painting can result in parallax errors if the camera is not absolutely perpendicular to the canvas. This causes distortion, particularly in the horizontal and vertical planes. I therefore used an image from the Royal Palace collection which revealed that the lines of the text were horizontal, even though the cartouche was not perfectly symmetrical. 
Unfortunately, the text on this image was illegible, so I superimposed one of my own images to check that it was properly aligned. I'm confident, therefore, that the relationship of the vertical line to the words is not an error. I concede that the line just touches the word my rather than crossing it. I believe that I'm on fairly safe ground to conclude that we have the word rosily written three times horizontally and that fru oh, that fruit of my love is written vertically. Now let's look at the frame uh, around the poem, uh, the cartouche. Not much of any interest, you might think, just a rather ornate frame for the poem. But take a closer look, as there are several important features. Firstly, there are three single flowers, one at the top and one on each side. There are two symmetrical O-shaped rings, one on each side. At the top, is another circular perforation with a square below it and two side pieces which curve forwards giving the appearance of outstretched arms. At the bottom there is a fourth circular perforation with a shaped surround. The flower has four pointed petals in a cruciform shape. Each one is aligned vertically. There are relatively few flowers with this configuration, and I believe the one of interest to us is Daphne. This genus has nearly a hundred species, varying from shrubs to alpines. Spurge laurel was recognised as Daphne by Gerard, as described in his Floral of 1597. The top two pictures are from his book, an illustration of the plant and details of its naming. That is the Greek word for laurel, Daphne. The Latin name is Daphnoides. So what is the connection between a woman's name and a laurel plant? Well, we need to go back to Ovid. Daphne was considered to be a minor figure in Greek mythology. She was a female nymph associated with fountains, wells, springs, streams and brooks. Various forms of the myth exist, but centre around the pursuit of Daphne by the Greco-Roman god Apollo, sometimes known as Phoebus. The story was interpreted by Ovid in Metamorphoses, Book 1. According to this uh, version, Apollo's infatuation was caused by a golden-tipped arrow shot at him by Cupid, son of Venus, who wanted to punish Apollo for having insulted his archery skills. And to demonstrate the power of love's arrow, Cupid also shot Daphne, but with a leaden-tipped arrow, the effect of which was to make her flee from Apollo. Elated with sudden love, Apollo chased Daphne continually. He tried to make her cease her flight by saying he did not wish to hurt her. When she kept fleeing, Apollo lamented that even though he had the knowledge of medicinal herbs, he had failed to cure himself from the wound of Cupid's arrow. When Apollo finally caught up with her, Daphne prayed for help to her father, the river god, who immediately commenced her transformation into a laurel tree, Laurus nobilis. A heavy numbness seized her limbs, thin bark closed over her breast, her hair turned into leaves, her arms into branches, her feet so swift a moment ago stuck fast in slow-growing roots, her face was lost in the canopy, only her shining beauty was left. Even this did not quench Apollo's ardour, and as he embraced the tree he felt her heart still beating. Then he declared, my bride, he said, since you can never be at least sweet laurel, you shall be my tree, my lure, my locks, my quiver, you shall wreathe. Upon hearing his words, Daphne bends her branches, unable to stop it. This sculpture by Jean Lorenzo Bernini shows the moment Daphne turns into a laurel. 
If you're not familiar with Benigni's work, please take a moment to marvel at what one man can do with a single piece of marble. To my mind, one of the most beautiful artistic creations. Now a bit more about Apollo. Apollo was a sun god of great antiquity, yet he is represented as an ever youthful god, just wise and of great beauty. Apollo represented the moral excellence that we think of today as civilization. His cult in Delphi had enormous influence on matters of state and religion, as well as on everyday law and order. As the god of muses, he presided over music, songs, dance and poetry. He also provided over medicine, either through himself or his son, Escapulus. In Roman times, he became known as by the epithet Phoebus, or bright, in other words, the god of light. Now we know that Edward de Vere referred to himself as Apollo. Arguably, Apollo was the god of all things at which he excelled. Here is a section of a poem written by de Vere. I'll return to the circumstances of this poem later. But at this stage, it's clear that de Vere was well aware of the myth from an early age. The myth of the god chasing something he could not have resonates with the theme of the painting. A crown of beige shall that man wear that triumphs over me, for black and tawny will I wear, which morning colours be. The more I followed one, the more she fled away, as Daphne did full long ago. Apollo's wishful prey. The more my plaints resound, the less she pities me. The more I sought, the less I found that mine she meant to be. Drown me, you trickling tears, you wayful whites of woe. Ah, a la la lantida, my dear dame has thus tormented me. To return to the cartouche, the detail on the right side has been partially obscured by the frame, so I've replaced the missing part by copying the other side. The spelling of Daphne in Greek begins with the letter Delta. So we have Daphne three times written over each of the flowers. Now, Daphne is the uh, fourth letter, Delta, of the Greek alphabet. So if we replace this with figure fours, we have three fours. Now, if we describe a circle within the three perforations, then three forties appear. The next uh, observation is that the scrolls on the cartouche are ribbed on their outer sides. Together with the cross piece, this could be interpreted as a T. So we have three forties, and four T's. Special numbers of Edward de Vere, allied to the triple tau emblem. If we return to the cartouche frame and join the centres of the three circular perforations, the shape described is the Greek capital letter Delta. As I discussed earlier, John D sometimes signed his name with that letter Delta. He followed it with a dot. Delta dot, the circular projection on the right side of the capital delta, fulfills that role. This is based on a Hebrew system called Nikud, in which dots were used to denote the pronunciation of consonants in a language which does not have vowels. In this case, it tells us to pronounce delta dot as D. Alexander Waugh goes into this in more detail in his presentation. The small square perforation lies within the larger triangle and may represent the quaternary within the tertiary. In other words, a four-sided object within a three-sided one. The philosophy of John Dee. You will remember I discussed You will remember I discussed the Cairo symbol uh, with respect to Edward de Vere, combining the numerical values. You will remember I discussed the Cairo symbol with respect to Edward de Vere, combining the uh, numerical values of rho, 17, and chi, 40.
Well, if you draw lines between the centres of the cutouts on the scrolls, then these intersect with a vertical line down the centre of the cartouche. The top of the row can be drawn along the edge of one side of one of the arms at the top of the cartouche to complete the Cairo Christogram. In addition, the vertical line bisects the word of, from which one might read OXF, the first three letters of Oxford. Now let's look at whether or not the findings from the poem fit with the Latin inscriptions in the painting. You'll remember the three inscriptions were on the left hand side. The first emerges from a swallow's mouth and translates as a just complaint of injustice. This is completely consistent with the first verse of the poem and I would now interpret the swallow as the poet's muse and the whole work of art being skillfully designed complaint about how the poet had been treated by Elizabeth. The second translates as thus what is mine is mine. It appears to be carved onto the trunk of the tree. I would now interpret this as Elizabeth recording a loss and the interpretation of the poem that this is her son as heir. The third inscription is being spoken of into the ear of the stag. It translates as pain is pain's medicine. A colloquial expression might be get over it. This would certainly fit with the human Elizabeth feeling love and sympathy for the stag but her alter ego, the goddess Diana, remaining harsh and unbending. The stag will not be allowed to speak again. Lastly, I'd like to draw your attention to another poem written many years before. This man is Richard Edwards. He was a poet, playwright and composer. And during his lifetime, he built up a collection of his own works and those composed by others. After his death in 1566, the collection came into the hands of the printer, Henry Diffel. The introductory epistle to Henry Compton confirms that the poems were composed before Richard Edwards died. The collection was not published until 1576 and entitled Paradise of Dainty Devices. It was updated in the 1596 edition of the book, which I've not as yet been able to locate. You will see that one of the authors is named E.O. This stood for Edward Oxenford or Earl of Oxenford, i.e. Edward de Vere. The book contained eight of his early poems, which, if Henry Diffel is right, were written before he was 16. I am slightly doubtful about this. Henry Diffel does not say that all of the poems were written before 1566. What we can be sure of is that de Vere wrote them before 1576. We've heard part of one of them earlier, which was entitled A Crown of Bays, in which he describes an unattainable dame. I'd like to introduce you to another one entitled A Lover Rejected Complaineth. If written early, we can consider a 16-year-old youth supremely well-educated, brimming with self-confidence, living in the house of William Cecil and effectively the Queen's stepchild. A youth who is hopelessly besotted with the Queen, who has eyes only for Robert Dudley. How could the youth express himself but by poetry? As you listen to it, also note the theme and the vocabulary. If written later, the rejection might concern the fallout following the birth of a child. The trickling tears that fall along my cheeks, the secret sighs that show my inward grief, the present pains perforce that love I seeks, bid me renew my cares without relief, in woeful song, in dull display, my pensive heart for to betray. Betray thy grief, thy woeful heart, with speed. Resign thy voice to her that caused thee woe. With irksome cries bewail thy late done deed, for she thou lovest is sure thy mortal foe. And help for thee there is no sure, but still in pain thou must endure. 
The stricken deer hath helped to heal his wound, the haggard hawk with toil is made full tame, the strongest tower the cannon lays on ground, the wisest wit that ever had the fame was thrall to love by Cupid's slights, then weigh my cause with equal whites. She is my joy, she is my care and woe, she is my pain, she is my ease therefore. She is my death, she is my life also. She is my soul, she is my wounded sore. In fine, she hath the hand and knife that may both save and end my life. And shall I live on her earth to be her thrall? And shall I live and serve her all in vain? And kiss the steps that she lets fall? And shall I pray the gods to keep the pain? from her that is so cruel. No, no, on her, work all your will. And let her feel the power of all your And let her feel the power of all your might. And let her have her most desire with speed. And let her pine away both day and night. And let her moan and none lament her need. And let all those that she shall see despise her state and pity me. Of course this poem could have been written to a young lady of the court. I do wonder if this poem was written by the love-struck Edward de Vere for his idol Elizabeth and later formed part of the basis for the poem in the cartouche. So we have tears running down cheeks, secret sighs, the use of pensive and above all an overwhelming feeling of rejection interweave the myth of Diana and Actaeon, Ovid's source for which de Vere was working on at the time, and you have the makings of the illustrated sonnet that was to emerge in 1600 at the foot of the painting of Elizabeth as goddess Diana. Well, thank you for making it this far. Many of the concepts I've discussed are very hard to grasp at first hearing. I can take no credit for discovering them. That honour goes to my learned friend Alexander Waugh. I have merely applied his discoveries to a new topic. What I've presented to you is a series of observations on the poem and cartouche within the pregnancy portrait. You may disagree with some, or indeed all of them. You could say that I had preconceived ideas as to what I was uh, looking for and chose those that fitted. The result may have been different if, for example, I'd been looking for the words the moon is made of green cheese within the poem. It isn't there, uh, by the way. Although the observations of my learned friend Alexander War may be new to you, I hope that you can begin to understand the complexity of the ciphers used to avoid detection. It's crucial to remember that this painting, although altered over the years, is a genuine original 16th century document, making a very big and indeed very expensive statement. Whether or not it was intended to embarrass those living at the time or to convey a message to future generations to set the record straight is of course unknown. It is remarkable that it survived, and I believe it has done so for a number of reasons. Firstly, its secrets, and there may be more, were hidden by one of the world's finest cryptographers, John Dee. Secondly, it came right at the end of Elizabeth's reign. The succession was secure, and soon the painting was tucked away in various royal palaces, labelled Elizabeth in a fancy dress. Very few people ever looked at it, and certainly no member of the general public. In 1838, it was moved to Hampton Court Palace, where it was in public display. To be honest, few people took much notice until interest grew over the authorship question concerning the Shakespeare canon, and the painting's existence was revealed by Dr Paul Altrocci. Today the picture is too famous for it to suddenly vanish. All attempts for a dialogue with those responsible for it are met with silence, raising the possibility that they know more about it than they're letting on. My aim was to bring these findings to a wider audience and open them up to scrutiny, so any valid criticism or contributions are welcome. Here is a brief summary of what I have discussed. The use of the swallow as a muse links to the unknown poet in Sir John Davis's poem Orchestra, almost certainly Edward de Vere. 
it may link at a deeper level to the myth of Philomela and Procne. The former rendered mute, explained herself by art, and both transformed into a swallow and nightingale respectively, finding expression in new ways. A swallow and a songbird, possibly a nightingale, is found in the painting. I've explained the importance of numbers in the minds of Tudor cryptologists, such as John Dee and his followers, Edward de Vere. In particular, the concept of each individual having numbers which relate them to the Trinity, the so-called quaternary within the tertiary. The secret numbers 17 and 40, associated with Edward de Vere, appear several times within the frame and poem, as I believe does the Cairo Christogram. The triangular number 153 in the ring on Elizabeth's thumb is pointing directly towards the stag. 153 is the triangular number based on 17. The signature of John D appears hidden in the geometry of the cartouche frame, suggesting that he was involved with the encryption process. The frame itself has three flowers, each with four petals, and I believe these to be from the plant Daphne. The Greek myth of Daphne, translated by Ovid, describes the water nymph being pursued by Apollo, an identity assumed by Edward de Vere, and changed into a laurel tree to escape him. The words Rosalie can be derived from lines 1, 7 and 9 of the poem, a line total of 17, referring to Henry Rosalie, 3rd Earl of Southampton. A vertical line based on the 17th word, on, crosses or touches the words, that fruit of my love. The combination being, Rosalie is that fruit of my love. Within the last line, the two words, love tree, contain the name Evere and a T, which is similar to the Tau, another symbol used by De Vere. The last line is a perfect anagram of Evere is the true father of my still life babe. And lastly, early poems by Edward de Vere bear similarities in vocabulary and sentiment to the poem in the cartouche. Whoever designed the allegory of the painting had a very deep understanding of the works of Ovid and was well aware of the relationship of Elizabeth to the goddess Diana as demonstrated in the Grove of Diana at Nonsuch. So what can we hope to draw from all of this? Well, I think that more has emerged from my analysis than I hope to find. I believe it all adds weight to my proposal that the stag is Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford, and also that the design of the painting and poem was at least assisted by John Dee. The conviction forming in my mind is that the painting was executed to set the record straight, to tell future generations what really happened at the end of Elizabeth's reign. This had to be done in a way that would bypass the censors. Unfortunately, it's taken 400 years before we've begun to understand the message. The painting, which may well have been a pair with the rainbow portrait, showing Elizabeth in two different guises as Astria and Diana, is loaded with coded information. Not least of which is the reference to Shakespeare's poem, The Phoenix and the Turtle Dove as I described in my first video. As I said at the very beginning of my work on this painting, the issue resolves itself into three questions. Firstly, is the subject of the painting Elizabeth I? And I believe so. Is she de depicted as being pregnant? Uh, I believe so. And if so, who was the father and who was the son? And I believe that we're now closing in on the answers to question three. Unless all my findings are just by chance, they point to Henry Rosalie being the heir to Elizabeth I, and that his father was Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford. Not a new assertion, it's one version of the new, of the so-called Prince Tudor theory. Could this all possibly be true? There seems to be a very strong evidence against it. Well, that, my friends, will be the subject of my next video. Thank you very much for getting this far.